Hello, welcome, welcome back to a second study on the book of Genesis. You know, Genesis is where it all got started and we are so excited that you've taken the time to walk through with us this exciting, revealing study of something that we sometimes tend to forget. How did it all get started? Mm -hmm. If you find out how it got mm -hmm. started, you can appreciate how God is going to restore everything back to the way it was before the fall. And I'm surely looking forward to that. And I pray that that is all, also your desire. Well, today our family is uh, people that you've met before, but uh, the sons of Zebedee are here. I am John, <laughs> and right next to me is my brother James. Hey, John. <laughs> it is good to be here with you. Good to have you. Uh, pleasure. And another John. This is just an overload. We are all the sons of Zebedee. <laughs> Pastor John Dinsey, good to have you here. Thank you. It's a blessing to be here as well. And it's good to have the ladies to balance it out. Miss Jill, our, our CFO, C, well, actually COO. That's right. And Vice President. One of those C's. Yeah, one of those C's. <laughs> Always good to have you here. I, I think you might have some lists for us today. I think we might. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. And Miss Shelley, the lady from Texas. I'm just an OO without the C in front of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, good to have all of you here. James, would you begin with prayer for us? Yes, let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you again for this opportunity to study your word, especially the book of Genesis where it all began. And we're looking for a picture of Christ and salvation, of an understanding of our humanity and how you love us and how you're working in our behalf. We ask that you'll be with us, with our listeners, guide and direct us through the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, our memory text is Genesis 3.15. And this is the first prophecy in scripture that foretells the ultimate victory that Christ would bring. Amen. You know, when you study this, I did a sermon once called The Seed, and it starts in Genesis 3.15. And what the Lord revealed to me is if you go through the battles that the children of Israel had, the purpose for, for that was Satan was trying to stop that seed. Amen. Mm. His, determined, his determined purpose was if that seed comes to fruition, I'm in trouble. Mm. Because he was told that when this seed, which is Christ, comes to fruition and walks the earth, he is going to step on your head. Mm. And he was determined that that would not happen. But praise the Lord, he prevailed. Mm. So let's look at the memory text together. Genesis 3.15, the Bible says, on the heels of man's eviction from that perfect setting, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, mm -hmm. between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Mm -hmm. You know, the Bible also has bookends. Genesis is the left bookend and Revelation is the right <laughs> bookend. You find in the beginning of the saga, the woman and the serpent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You find at the end of the saga, the woman and the serpent. What I like about the woman and the serpent in the book of Revelation is he comes to her thinking that she's the same woman that he met in Genesis. And she says, wait a minute, I got a different husband. I'm not having it. And then he becomes angry mm. and tries to get rid of her. But this time she is victorious through the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, I want to begin with a statement that uh, I think you'll chew on a little bit more as we go through the lesson. Creation was inclusive as well as exclusive. Mm -hmm. Why do I say that? God gave humanity everything, but he did not intend for us to know everything. Mm. Mm. Inclusive. Every tree of the field, everything about my creation is for you, except mm -hmm. he gave us everything, but he did not intend for us to know everything. Mm. Yeah. God gave humanity all that we would need. And if you look at what happens today, and this is still a pattern in many lives, Sin is often born when we go looking for what God didn't give to us. True. When God establishes a prohibition, it tends to open to us this inquisitive side. Like if you say to somebody, don't look, what do they do? Look. <laughs> so if you say to them, so what you need to do, parents, is say to your children, look, and they won't look. You got to find a way psychologically to fool them because sometimes if you say to people, watch out, they don't pay attention to that. It's the human nature to want to go in the opposite direction. But the writer asked the question, who is the serpent and how does, how did he deceive Eve? Mm -hmm. I'm going to share some scriptures with you in just a moment, but let me just walk you through uh, a word that stuck out to me, the word deception. Mm -hmm. It is called deception because the one that's being deceived is ignorant of the fact that yeah. he or she is being deceived. Mm -hmm. Deception is very clever. So 
I want to I want to settle this point right here because I've heard it so many times out of context. Mm. James, people have said, even the elect will be deceived. Mm. And I said, wait a minute, there's this little word, mm. if, mm -hmm. and the next word, possible, mm. which means in the same way, Shelley, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats can <laughs> cleanse us from our sin. It is not possible that the elect will be deceived because they are the elect. Mm -hmm. So, but, but how does deception work? The text begins with the phrase, the serpent. Let's go to Genesis chapter three and look at the first introduction. Now, it's, it's strange, in the, in the beginning of the, of the saga is, in the beginning, God. Mm -hmm. Then the Sabbath is introduced, and then the nemesis is introduced in chapter 3 and verse 1. Now the serpent mm -hmm. was more cunning or subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, now notice, he opened the door to conversation. Now, this conversation could not have happened if Eve wasn't where she was prohibited from being. Now, God didn't say to her, don't go to the tree. He said, don't partake of it. Mm -hmm. But you'll notice that if you are overcoming some kind of temptation or if you are susceptible to temptation, it's better not to go and see whether or not the temptation is still there. Mm than to go and realize the temptation is greater than you are. Mm -hmm. So Eve, I believe, would have been better off had she not gone mm -hmm. to the tree than going to the tree, determining whether or not she was fit to face somebody she had never faced before. The nemesis, the one who is involved in deception. Who is he? Let's go to Revelation 12 and verse 7 to 9. Who is he? Re Revelation chapter 12, verse 79. And you'll notice that Revelation, as I said, is the right bookend and Genesis is the left book end. Do you have that, James? Revelation yes. 12, verse 79. Read that for us. And there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought in his angels, mm -hmm. and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the dragon was cast out, the, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, what I want to notice is even though he changes his methods of deception, mm -hmm. he's still into deception. Mm. He began with the woman, but now he's going to conclude with the world. Mm. He's expanding his territory. Mm. And Revelation 16, 13 talks about the way he's going to do that. Three unclean spirits like frogs out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. They go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Mm -hmm. So he's now increasing his arsenal. He's also increasing his, um, his allies. He has the whole world allied against God. And, but this time he's seeking to bring the woman down again. Mm -hmm. Because Revelation 12, verse 7 to 9 is a prelude to Revelation 12, verse 17. He's angry with her, so this time he's pulling the entire world together for his final attempt. I don't often read quotations from Ellen White in reference to the lesson, but this one is unavoidable. Mm -hmm. It was included in the lesson. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 53. In order to accomplish his work unperceived, that's, that's the key to deception, mm -hmm. unperceived, Satan chose to employ as his medium the serpent, a disguise well adapted for his purpose of deception. Mm -hmm. The serpent was then one of the wisest and most beautiful creatures of the earth. Quite a far cry from what it used to be. Mm. It had wings and while flying through the air, presented an appearance of dazzling brightness, mm. having the color and brilliancy of burnished gold. Now, James, you study Revelation. What does that sound like? Mm. A description of Christ. Mm -hmm. Revelation 1. Exactly, a mm -hmm. description of Christ. So Satan is also, his deception is to mask who he is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in something that will c catch your eyes, but not engage your mind. Mm. And that's how deception happened. And I brought these four points out, Jill. Deception, sin hides its dark side initially. Secondly, sin suggests that disobedience brings enrichment. Mm. You'll be like God. Sin cloaks itself in a harmless disguise. Mm -hmm. And sin conceals its identity behind a veil of authenticity. Mm. It says, hey, if there's anybody you can trust, you can trust me because mm. God is not open with you. He knows that if you find out what he doesn't want you to know, mm -hmm. then you'll be just like him. So mm. you could trust me. 
2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 15, what he did then, he's still doing today. Yeah. What he did then, he's still hiding his deceptive identity behind a cloak of authenticity. Mm -hmm. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 13 to 15. You have that, Jill? I do. Okay. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Now grab that part again. He hides himself behind a cloak of authenticity. What are we being told here by Paul the Apostle? Because they look legitimate doesn't mean that they are. That's right. Amen. Ministers. Now, I would never think that the word ministers, he hides behind people that have transformed themselves. Mm -hmm. They have not been transformed by God. Mm -hmm. They take the job of transforming mm -hmm. themselves. Good God point. didn't have anything to do with it, but they look the part. They look authentic. That's good. Mm -hmm. they, but, but the end result is going to be exactly as it will be for the one who uses them for the art of deception. The fourth point is God does not deceive but he allows temptation. Mm. Mm. Look at James chapter 1, verse 13 to 15. Mm -hmm. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Mm -hmm. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The mm -hmm. story that came to my mind is that of Samson. You know, Samson's heart was engaged, but his mind was disengaged. Mm. And when you, read, when, you, when you read that story, he was not attacked at his point of weakness. He was attacked at the point of his greatest strength. She did not ask him, where does your weakness lie? She said, where does your strength lie? Mm. We tend to think that we fall into temptation because the devil attacks us at our weak points. No, mm. he attacks us at our strongest point That's very so good. that anything after that is easy. That's why people tend to fall so completely because he looks for the strongest thing. You may have heard the phrase, we are only as strong as our weakest, weakest link. Mm. So he says, where's your strength? And when he breaks the strongest thing in you, he can bring you to mm. the place where he brought Samson. That is a place of blindness. So keep this in mind as I transition to the next day. God did not tempt Adam and Eve. He tested them. Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat of it you shall surely die. Mm -hmm. Why did the Lord do that? Because here's the point as I transition. God never wants us to serve him out of fear. Yeah. He wants us to be obedient out of love and a willing heart. That's the foundation of true loyalty. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Well, my name is James Rafferty and I have Monday's lesson, The Forbidden Fruit. Mm -hmm. And it is based on Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 and Genesis 3, 1 through 6. And let's just read those verses. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, 16 and 17. I'll read those if someone would like to read 3, verses 1 through 6 when I'm finished. Okay. It says there in verse 16, And the Lord commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Okay. All right. Genesis one, 1 to 6. Yes. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is the, in the midst of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent, verse 4, said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it was pleasant to the eye, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her. And he ate. So this is basically the beginning of what we would call the great controversy between mm. good and evil, between God and Satan. And we're kind of caught in the middle. Mm. And we see that right here in the beginning of this story. We have Genesis chapter 2 and Genesis chapter 3. And there's a complete difference between what God says mm -hmm. and what the serpent says. Right. And we're listening to God and we're listening to the serpent. We're getting two different stories, right? Mm -hmm. So the lesson quarterly says, let's just look at the differences between the speeches. And I noticed that the first difference that you see here is that God says, 
of every tree of the garden you may freely eat. The serpent says, uh, you're not supposed to eat of every tree of the garden, are you? <laughs> So God is, is actually telling us, and this is really interesting, God is actually telling us, you can freely eat of every tree. Now, if you eat of that one tree, what's going to happen to you? Hmm. You're going to die. You're, You're going to die. But the freedom to, to eat of that tree is still there. God didn't actually make it so that we couldn't eat of it. We have the freedom to eat of it. But God has told us there's a consequence to eating of that one tree, and you can eat of freely of every tree. Satan tries to make God out to be a withholder. He's trying to say, well, God is kind of restricting you here. Actually, God doesn't restrict freedom. No. Even freedom to choose against Him. Mm -hmm. Okay, the second parallel that I thought was interesting was, God says, in the day that you eat of that tree, you will surely die. What does the serpent say? Hmm, you will not. You will not surely yeah. die. So it's exactly the opposite of what God says. And then the third point, God says, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat of that tree. Do not. The serpent says, well, you can eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. You'll be like God's. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll be like God if you eat of that tree. So you've got this contrast and a, an exact opposite or contradiction. So what is the meaning of all this? What, what is the point of this contradiction? Well, really, if you think about it, the serpent is misrepresenting God and leading us to distrust him. Mm -hmm. And this is, the, this is the core of this controversy that we're involved in. That's why so many people today just do not trust God. They just do not trust religion. They just do not trust the Bible. And they ask questions like, well, if God is love, why? If God loves us, why? Because they have, this seed has been planted within the human heart right from Genesis, right from the very beginning. The seed has been planted to distrust the words of God. That's yeah. what Satan is trying to do. He's trying to get us to distrust the words of God. You see, friends, the Word of God, the Bible, is our only sure hope in this world today. Right. And if Satan can get us to distrust those words, we're going to be like a ship without an anchor, mm -hmm. tossed to and fro in the, in, the, in the waves of this world. Mm -hmm. And so Satan is doing everything he can to get us to distrust the Word of God. It's the only thing that we can trust. In fact, I can tell you myself, and I'm sure we can all testify, that it's the Word of God that changed my life and changed my Amen. heart. Amen. That yes. gave me a completely different direction in this world. So when we think about this, I want to think about the three things that Satan uh, pushed over onto God, made God look like, first of all, that he was selfish. Hmm. God is selfish. Uh, he doesn't want you to be like him. Now think about this. He doesn't want you to be like him. They were already like him. <laughs> they were, we were made in God's image. We were already, so every time Satan comes at us, you got to remember he's coming at us with something that usually is completely contradicting reality. The reality is Adam and Eve were made in the image of God. We were made in the image of God. God doesn't want you to be like him. We are like him. We're already mm -hmm. like him. Be patient. Wait. Mm -hmm. When we first got created, we were a day old. We looked like we were probably 20 or 30 years old, but we were a day old. And being a day old, we didn't know everything. A, a newborn baby doesn't know everything. And so God was working with us. God was training us. God was educating us. So there was a lot for us to learn. But, and like you said, John, there was a lot that we didn't know yet. True. But we, God was going to bring us to that place. Now, number two, God is a liar. Satan was trying to make God out to be a liar. You will not surely die. God says you will surely die. If you eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you're going to die. But Satan tries to say, no, you're not going to die. So Satan is trying to undermine the word of God. And of course, they already had access to the tree of life, which perpetuates life. So really, they didn't need to worry about this claim that you're surely going to die. If they would just be faithful to God and trust God and trust his word, that claim, that idea would have no hold on them. So Satan is continually seeking to contradict what God is saying because he wants to undermine our trust in him. He wants to undermine our trust in his word. Mm -hmm. Satan is seeking to completely cause us to distrust God. Number three, God is a controller. You cannot eat of all the trees. God is withholding something from you. God wants to control you. God wants to make sure that you don't have access to something. So God here, again, is painted out in a character that's not in harmony with who he really is. God has given us access to all the trees. Now, there's one tree that if we access that tree and eat of that fruit, it's going to lead to terrible consequences. And God lays that out for us. 
But the fact of the matter is we still had the freedom to choose to eat of that tree. And of course, that's why we're here right now. That's why we're in our situation right now. Mm -hmm. So God is seeking to accuse. In fact, in Revelation chapter 12, we looked there already, John, there's another verse, verse 10, that, that describes Satan as an accuser. He's an accuser of the brethren that accuses us before God day and night. So we've got this characteristic of Satan that is seeking to undermine the character, the truth about who God is. And the Word of God, the Bible, is seeking to bring us a, a light and understanding of who God really is. Have you ever been misrepresented before? Have you ever had people say things about you that weren't true? And you know, it feels really uncomfortable. You know, when people say things about you that aren't true, you feel uncomfortable. Well, welcome to God's world. That's where God lodges. That's what his whole, this whole controversy is all about. His whole kingdom has been misrepresented by Satan. And many of us have joined in with Satan to misrepresent God. Yes, God is a God of love and a lot of yes. people are missing that. Mm -hmm. They're missing that about God because they believe the words of the accuser. And that's why we're told in John chapter 14 that Jesus has come to reveal the Father. He says to Peter, have I been, or to uh, Thomas, no, Philip, Philip, have I been so long with you? Do you have you not seen the Father? <laughs> If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This was the mission of Christ, to reveal who the Father really is. And it's the mission of Christians. That's right. As those who follow Christ, we are called to do exactly what Jesus came to do, and that is to reveal the true character of God in this world. Mm -hmm. So just as we close out here, a couple of thoughts. You know, Satan's arguments uh, against the Word of God are continuing to this day. Satan is seeking to undermine God's Word, to undermine the Bible, to undermine the truth. He wants us to misunderstand God so that we mistrust Him. So how can we be protected from these assaults of Satan, from these, as John, you explained it, they're, they're very subtle attacks mm -hmm. because Satan doesn't always represent himself as he is. Right. Many times he comes in a guise that we don't recognize. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that's really important for us is to believe the Word of God. This all started with disbelieving the Word of God. God has actually given us the Bible. He's given us the Old and the New Testament. And unlike Eve, when he, she listened to the words of Satan, God wants us to listen to his words and to believe his words. So one of the ways that we can stand for God in these last days is to believe his Word. Mm -hmm. The second thing mm -hmm. is that we do not want to believe that which contradicts God's words. That's right. So yes, we've got the Word of God, but then we've got a lot of things that come unto us that contradict the Word of God. And Eve took a hold of those things which were contradictory to God's Word. We don't want to do that. We want to hold to God's Word and we want to just let go of those things that contradict God's Word. And finally, number three, we don't want to lead others to turn away from God. Mm. So Eve mm. turned away from God and then she led Adam to turn away from God. So we want to be those who believe God's Word. We want to throw away those things that contradict God's Word. And we don't want to leave other, lead others away from God, away from His Word. We mm. want to lead others to God's Word. Amen. 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 Thank, you, thank you so much, James. And we're talking about the fall. How did the fall happen and what can we learn from it? We're going to go on Tuesday right after this break, so don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could watch a 3 ABN Sabbath School panel again? Or share it on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter? Well, you can by visiting 3ABNSabbathSchoolPanel.com. A clean design makes it easy to find the program you're looking for. There are also links to the Adult Bible Study Guide so you can follow along. Sharing is easy. Just click share and choose your favorite social media. Share a link. Save a life for eternity. Hello, welcome back to 3ABN Sabbath School. We're going to go to Tuesday and uh, Johnny, it's yours. Thank you so much. My name is John Dinsey. Tuesday's lesson, the title is Hiding Before God. This takes us to Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. Verse 7 says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting that it says the eyes of both of them were opened. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to understand they weren't going around with their eyes closed. <laughs> uh, they were open in a sense that is different from what they expected. Now they were open to know evil and good which the devil painted as something that would be, would be beneficial. Mm. But they had the bitter 
sorrow of knowing that it was not to their benefit, mm -hmm. it was to their detriment. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting what the lesson says, and I like to read, the, read it here, it says, after they sinned, Adam and Eve felt naked because they lost their garments of glory, which reflected God's presence. Perhaps mm -hmm. you've heard this before, where the uh, Adam and Eve were wearing a garment of light provided by God, but they must have lost something when they sinned. Mm -hmm. And the lesson brings out two scriptures, uh, two passages that i like to read to you. Psalms chapter 8, verse 5. Psalms 8, 5 says, For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Mm -hmm. And now the lesson turns to Psalms 104, verse 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honor and majesty who covers thyself with light as with a garment, who stretches out the, the heavens like a curtain. And it is believed, understood, that Adam and Eve had this <laughs> garment of light that they lost when they sinned because now they were in a new condition. They were now sinners. Hmm. They were now sinners. So uh, let's move to Genesis chapter two, uh, chapter three, verse eight. Uh, notice what it says, very powerful. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So this is something very interesting. They heard the voice of God walking in the cool of the day. Now, they heard the voice of God to me, uh, gives me an understanding that they were familiar with His mm -hmm. voice. They were familiar. Perhaps mm -hmm. you may also be familiar with people and the way they walk. Uh, <laughs> some people walk a certain way, ah, that's so and so, walking. Uh, but they heard the voice, it says. What God was saying uh, is not sure. We know that later He called Adam by name. Mm -hmm. Now, listen. Listen very carefully. It says, uh, it says that they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God. Now, why were they hiding? Mm -hmm. the, God knew why they were hiding. And the fact that they hid themselves uh, was something different. They, they were accustomed to when God the Creator came, they immediately went to Him. But now something different has happened. And God has to call by name, where are you. Mm -hmm. Now this is, uh, takes us to Genesis chapter 3 verse 9. The Lord called to Adam and said to him, where are you? Mm -hmm. And I like to uh, look at this in a certain way because, you know, it's interesting that after Adam and Eve sinned, they didn't go around looking for God. Now we got to go to God and talk to him about this. No, <laughs> they in fact were hiding from God mm -hmm. and God is looking for them. And uh, it reminds me of Jesus that came to seek and to save that which was lost. God comes looking for them because he knew what had happened. So let's, right. let's continue reading here. And... Uh, uh, in other words, God takes the first step. Adam and Eve did not go looking for God. God takes the first step. Verse, verse 10 now, Genesis 3.10. So he said, uh, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and hit myself. For the first time ever in his life, Adam and Eve are now experiencing fear. Mm. One of the results of sin. Sin brings fear. Mm. Yes. Uh, obedience right. does not bring fear. Obedience brings right. joy. Yeah. Mm. And they now felt fear. So mm. it, it, it's just a, a multitude of problems that sin brings into the world. Mm -hmm. So Genesis chapter 3, verse 11, and he said, who told you, God is talking to them, mm -hmm. who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? This question now brings Adam and Eve the opportunity to express and confess their sin. That's why the question is asked. When God asks a question, there is a reason why. Have you eaten of the tree? Now notice what it says, I command that you that you should not eat. Now they had freedom of choice. This is why they ate of the tree. This is a gift from God. We still have freedom of choice. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord for that, that That's we right. can choose to walk away from evil and choose to follow God. Mm -hmm. We have freedom and freedom is found in God. So they chose to eat of the tree of life. I mean, the mm -hmm. tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, notice then what uh, Adam responds. Mm -hmm. You see, Adam could neither deny or excuse himself 
This is what verse 12 says, Genesis 3, 12. The man said, the woman <laughs> whom you gave <laughs> to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Oh, now, Eve was right there. <laughs> he says, the woman that you gave me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. What is implied here when Adam says, the woman you gave me, it, it, seems to, it seems like he is putting part of the blame on God mm. and mm. part of the blame on Eve. Mm. He's not taking responsibility for himself. Right. It's basically, you know, I know they didn't have guns in those days, but Eve didn't say, okay, Adam, you're gonna eat of this, you're gonna eat of this fruit. <laughs> Uh, he had a choice, mm. but he chose to eat of the tree of his own accord. He was not forced. And this is something important mm. to bring out. Satan cannot force any one of us right. to do anything. He presents to us a temptation and we must choose whether to do the evil or not do the evil. And we are now in a condition of weakness that we are, are totally dependent upon God to be able to have victory, to be able to say no to the devil. So the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. Now it's interesting the way this is brought out that after Adam speaks and he says what happened, God does not immediately talk to Adam about the consequences of his sin. He said, the woman gave me. So now God questions the woman. And then eventually the woman says, oh, it's the serpent. So God then <laughs> talks to the serpent. But then he goes back and he gives to each one the, uh, first he goes to the serpent and he says, this is what's going to happen to you. This is what's going to happen to you. And this is what's going to happen to you. So now let's go to, let's go to um, uh, Job chapter 31, verse 3. Job chapter 31, verse 33, 33, Job 31, 33. Notice what it says here. If I covered my transgressions as Adam by hiding my iniquity in my bosom. So, so Job saying, I'm not going to hide my transgression. He says, if I cover my transgression as Adam was trying to cover his sin to say he wasn't guilty, he was trying to find an excuse uh, which, to which there were none. It's almost like if you had not given me that woman, mm. I would have been fine. <laughs> if you had not had made the woman, I would have been fine. You made the woman. So God, he's putting blame upon God in this. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 13. And the Lord God said to the woman, what is it? What is this you have done? I, I look at these words and I say, wow, there's, there's an exclamation here of sorrow and, and, and uh, heaviness. What is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Mm. So we see here that sin uh, brings a situation in the minds of people that they start making excuses, mm. start putting blame on mm. others. Mm. And Eve now shifts the blame to the serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. Uh, so we see here that they're not taking full responsibility for their sin. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 says, He that covereth his sins mm. shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mm. mercy. Uh, you know, uh, there is this... Um, a uh, statement by Ellen G. White is uh, uh, FH, it says 191. We have the Christians in this, this age are inclined to accept the sophistries of Satan in the place of the words of God. Many have separated themselves from God by wicked works and they love not to behold God or to retain him in their knowledge. They do not want to see God any more than did Adam when he hid himself from the approach of his heavenly mm. father. Right. And God... Uh, you know, we, we read in the Bible that God has thoughts of peace concerning us. Mm -hmm. Jesus is coming. Jesus continues to seek and right. to save that which was lost. And I encourage you that if you have sinned, go to the Lord and confess your sins. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor Johnny. Each one of you, what an incredible lesson as we look at the entrance of sin unfortunately, mm -hmm. into this world that we live in. We see the serpent and Eve being deceived and Adam stepping into transgression. My name is Jill Morricone. I almost forgot to say that. And I have Wednesday's lesson, which is the fate of the serpent. Mm -hmm. As Pastor Johnny already brought out, God talks to Adam, then God talks to Eve, then God talks to the serpent. And that's the portion of my lesson, mm -hmm. the fate of the serpent. 
What is the fate of the serpent? Now we could just read Genesis 3, 14 and 15 and find out. But I wanna start from a different angle and then we'll come back to that. We're gonna start from the end point. Have you ever questioned God's justice? Hmm. Hmm. Have you ever questioned God's justice? Asaph did, I hope I pronounced his name right. This is Psalm chapter 73. Hmm. Psalm 73, verses two and three. He said, as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He looked at the apparent prosperity of the wicked, looked at evil seeming to rise, saying, God, where are you? Mm -hmm. And then we jump down to verse 17, Psalm 73, mm -hmm. verse 17 until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them, that's the wicked, in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. In the sanctuary, we understand the plan of redemption set forth, Genesis 3.15, we'll get to that. We understand God's hatred of sin, but the redemption that he freely offers to sinners. And we also understand sin from the end point, from the point looking back, seeing what God has done, what Satan has done, and looking at the final destruction of the wicked. Have you ever questioned God's justice? Job did. Job chapter 21, let's look at that. Job 21 verse seven, why do the wicked live and become old? Why do they become mighty in power? Their descendants are established with them in their sight and their offspring before their eyes, verse nine. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. So it appears again that the wicked are prospering. What is the fate of the serpent and his followers? Verse 13, Job 21, verse 13, we see the fate. Here again, it's the end point. They spend their days in wealth and in a moment go down to the grave. The final destiny of the wicked, it changes our perspective. Have you ever questioned God's justice? Habakkuk did, we're going to Habakkuk. Habakkuk one, verse two through four. Now Job questioned God's fairness. He questioned God's justice because of the tragedy that he was enduring as a righteous man. Habakkuk, he questioned God's fairness and God's justice by demanding that God send judgments on the wicked. And he didn't think that the judgments were coming fast enough. So Habakkuk 1 verse 2, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you're not going to hear. Even cry out to you violence and you don't save. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore, perverse judgment proceeds. Mm. Habakkuk is questioning God's seeming lack of justice, his seeming lack of fairness. Again, I ask you, what is the fate of the serpent and his followers? In this case, you just go one verse and you see that God answers in verse five that he's gonna raise up the Babylonian army mm -hmm. to punish the children of is Judah. You see, justice always comes. Sometimes it's not when we expect it. So again, what is the fate of the serpent and his followers? I wanna give you five snapshots as we look at the unfolding fate of the serpent from Lucifer in heaven all the way down to Revelation chapter 20 in his final destruction. So when we look at Lucifer in heaven, let's go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 28, this is snapshot number one the ultimate destiny of the serpent, of Satan and his followers, was revealed at the rebellion in heaven. Ezekiel 28, verse 16, by the abundance of your trading. Now this is God talking to Lucifer, the covering cherub, before he was cast down to earth, before he became what we know as Satan. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones, verse 17. Mm -hmm. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Lucifer became proud. Mm -hmm. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you, verse 19. 
All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be, what's that word? No, no more forever. Mm, Here's the promise all the way from the beginning of the final destruction of sin, Satan, that serpent, the old devil. So we see this great controversy that is working out from Genesis chapter three all the way down to the end. It was prophesied at the very beginning. God said, I'm gonna wipe you out. The final destruction of Satan is sure. Snapshot number two, we look at the curse pronounced after sin on Satan. Now this is in Genesis three. Genesis 3, verse 14. Now, it's interesting to me, Genesis 3 is really a reversal of creation. Remember last week we studied Genesis 1 and 2. God said what? It is very good. After okay. every day, it is very good. There was appreciation of the good and the blessings. And here we see sin and judgment and evil and curses, but we also see redemption and hope in Christ Jesus. Right. Genesis 3, 14, the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you are more cursed than all cattle and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. Mm. Satan eating dust is a prophetic picture of his final degradation mm. and destruction that will take place at the end. Snapshot number three, the final destruction of Satan is prophesied in the very next verse, Genesis 3, 15. This is connected. This is the first messianic prophecy, Jesus being the seed, Genesis 3, 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, that's capital S, meaning Jesus, the coming Messiah. He, Jesus, shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Who's right. destroyed? The serpent. He's crushed on the head by Jesus himself. And war will exist between the followers of Jesus and the followers of Satan. It's gonna be a little painful for the followers of Jesus because a bruise on the heel could be a little painful. But Jesus' followers will not be destroyed because Jesus mm -hmm. triumphs over Satan. Amen. We see the comparison. Pastor John talked about this, I think, in Revelation 12, 17. The dragon, see in Eden, it's called the serpent. In Revelation, called the dragon. Mm. The dragon was enraged. You see in Genesis 3, 15, the enmity, that enmity is put in. And yet we see enraged, the anger there in Revelation 12. The dragon was enraged with the woman and went to make war with the rest of her offspring mm -hmm. who keep the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. The war that began in Eden was won at the cross mm -hmm. and will culminate in the final destruction of Satan and his followers. That brings us to snapshot number four, which is Christ's victory at the cross where Christ triumphed over Satan at the cross. We right. see John 12, 31 and 32. Mm -hmm. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world, that Satan, will be cast out. Why is that? Because Jesus is lifted up mm -hmm. and he will draw all people unto himself. Colossians 2, 15, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle over them, triumphing over them in it. So at the cross, Satan was disarmed. Satan was defeated. Amen. His head Amen. was crushed. First John 3, 8, he who sins is of the devil for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the son of God was manifested. Why? That he might destroy the works of the devil. Finally, snapshot number four. What is the fate of Satan? What is the fate of the serpent? What is the fate of his followers? Snapshot number five. Thank you, Shelley. Satan's final destruction is prophesied. We see this in Revelation 20, verse 10. The devil who deceived them, that's all the nations, was what? cast into the lake of fire and brimstone. Now we don't have time to study that. That does not mean he burns eternally forever, but he will be burned up. So if you are struggling today, if you are going through a battle, if you feel like you are in the middle of the great controversy battle, know with assurance that the Satan, that Satan will be killed and crushed forever. Amen. 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 Beautiful lesson. I have th Thursdays and it is human destiny. My name is Shelley Quinn. Just think, okay, we, let's picture Eve going into the middle of the garden. There is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that God told them not to eat of. Do you think there were gold fruit for, for the fruit of the good and red fruit for the fruit of evil? No. The tree of the knowledge 
the knowledge of good and evil. It was a singular fruit. And what the sin was, in bottom line, is that when they chose that fruit, when they picked it and ate it, they were deciding for themselves what was good and what was evil. Mm. I want to give you a definition of evil. You know, when we talk about evil, we might think of, of Hitler or someone that in you, oh, he's evil. But here's, here's a good definition of evil, disobedience to God. Mm -hmm. That's good. Due to not trusting him, mm -hmm. not believing him. And disobedience mm -hmm. is evil. It, it separates us from our creator of infinite love, infinite power and knowledge. And God's point from the very beginning when he said to them, look at all these beautiful trees I've mm. created. You can eat of any of them. You see this one? Children, I don't want you to try to decide what's good for yourself and what's evil for yourself. I know the end from the beginning. You don't. And I don't want you to experience the pain of knowing evil. To eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil meant to reject the relationship with God. To decide to become your own God, basically. So God pronounces blessings. And he pronounces curses, blessings on obedience, curses on uh, disobedience. That's his righteous judgment against disobedience. Now, I have to say to you, sometimes people say, why do y'all make such a fuss over the Hebrew definition and the Greek definition? Well, I'll tell you what, words are important. And let me give you an example. I recently was in the hospital. I had vestibular neuritis where the nerve from your ear to your brain goes haywire and I was so dizzy I couldn't stand up straight, ended up in the hospital. And when the nurse was reading the discharge, the doctor had written, patient is giddy. <laughs> well, my, I'm going to tell you, my old feelings were hurt. The only, <laughs> the only, I, <laughs> only word or definition I knew of giddy was that giddy meant you were silly, talkative, maybe a little disoriented, too excited. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I can't believe the doctor said that about me. And then I looked it up. Giddy is the medical term to have a sensation of whirling and a tendency to fall and stagger. So words are important, our understanding of the nuances of word. And when it comes to the word curse, boy, this is something God, God, his righteous judgment against sin is curse. But there are different words used for curses in the Hebrew and they have varying degrees of bitterness. Mm -hmm. There is a word, arar, means to pronounce yeah. a judgment on someone that's broken the covenant. It's used 60 times. But now when we get to Deuteronomy 27, where it says cursed is Deuteronomy 27 in 15 through 26, it says cursed is the man who basically breaks the covenant. Mm. That's another word. And, and it's used 12 times. Genesis, uh, oh, here's, if you compare Jeremiah's, cursed be the man that trusteth in man. Mm. And then blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord. Mm. This is another word for cursed. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say all of this because curse really, when, when God pronounces a curse, on, on a man for disobedience, it's summed up in these verses. Here, here's how we can sum up curse. Jeremiah 11, 3. Cursed be the man that obeyeth not the words of the covenant. Mm. Mm. You're under a curse. That's right. But then 
in Galatians 3.13, the New Testament responds saying, Christ has redeemed us from the curse, being made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree. So here's what I want to do. I want us to get into Genesis 3.14 because I wanted to point out a couple of things about this passage. In Genesis 3.14, it says, the Lord God, now this is his covenant name. When you see Lord God, mm. this is the name Jehovah, Yahweh. He says to the serpent, mm -hmm. you are more cursed than all the cattle. Mm. Well, I'll tell you what. Then he says in verse 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, capital S, speaking of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. he will bruise your head. He's going to crush you and you shall bruise his heel. Mm -hmm. You know what? This is explicitly a curse without hope. Do you see any hope in this? Mm -hmm. He's just saying, hey, you're cursed above everything. Mm -hmm. And and God is going to come down and take on the flesh as the seed of the woman, mm -hmm. become the son of man, mm -hmm. the son of God, and going to crush your head. You're, you are, as you said, your destiny is, you're out of here. <laughs> but in the midst of this curse passage, do you notice the hope? Because he says, mm. I'll put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Mm. He's going to bruise your heel. Satan would reach out. And, and cause pain to Christ. But Christ was going to overcome. Yeah. So the woman's offspring, he, the seed, is Christ. And even though Christ is going to give a fatal blow to the serpent, wow, hallelujah, the people have this hope of redemption. Amen. To the woman, verse 16, this is Genesis 3, 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In your pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband. He shall rule over you. Now you've got to look at that in the perspective. We should understand what God said to the woman in the perspective of salvation because through her is going to come this seed that will rescue the people. Then to Adam, he said in verse 17, because you've heeded the voice of your wife. See, Eve was deceived. Adam was not. Mm. Adam chose to That's disobey. Right. He said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, which I commanded you saying, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground. Now God is cursing the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life, both thorns and thistles it shall bring forth. You shall eat of the herb of the field and in the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken, for dust you are, Mm -hmm. You're dust that I molded and got down and breathed the breath of life into you. But when my breath of life is taken from you to dust, you shall return. Mm -hmm. And then verse 20 says, Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living beings. So God's, God doesn't specifically curse as he did with serpent or the ground, the man. He is under the curse of sin because he's disobeyed. And, and mm. wow, you know, God, it was grace that they didn't die right away mm. when they ate of it. But they were then sent out of the garden. God sent them away from the tree of life so that they wouldn't pluck from that tree of life and perpetuate their life as sinners. But verse 21 says, Adam and his wife, for the Lord, the Lord God made tunics of skin for them and clothed them. This is the first mm -hmm. sacrifice. sacrifice that we see in the Old Testament. I don't have time to go forward. But the point to know is this. Evil is disobedience to God. And God's righteous judgment against disobedience isn't something we want to have to endure. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. 
Well, Pastor James, give me a summary of the day you covered. Well, just this picture that we have starting in Genesis of God being misrepresented. And we know what that's like. And we know the kind of consequences it leads to, at least the terrible consequences. So God in Christ has come to set things right, to reveal who he really is, what he's really like, so we can trust him again. Amen. Thank you. Pastor John? You know, it is evident that Adam and Eve uh, eventually confessed and had true repentance because they accepted the tunics. They taught their children how to mm -hmm. sacrifice to God. Yes, amen. And so praise the Lord for that because uh, you also have to choose to follow God. Before you is good and evil, mm -hmm. choose the good. Amen. I had Wednesday, the fate of the serpent, and I don't know about you, but sometimes this world seems like there's a lot of sin, there's a lot of sickness, there's a lot of suffering. There's a lot of sorrow and pain, but this world is not all there is. And someday soon, God will completely wipe out Satan and his followers and we'll spend eternity with him. Amen. Amen. God doesn't want you to eat from the knowledge of the tree of good and evil. He doesn't want you to try to decide what's good for yourself and what's bad for yourself. We know so little. We're so prideful to think that we can do that. But what we've got to hold on to is how forgiving and loving our God is. And we know Revelation 22, 3 says that there, at the end, there's going to be no more curse. God wants to protect you from walking in the consequences of sin. Well, thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Jill. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, James. And thank you for taking the time to join us. We've had an exciting study mm -hmm. on the fall of man. How could the study on the fall of man be exciting? Well, we've learned something. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best way of saying it. But I want to leave this thought with you. Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Mm -hmm. Jesus is able to keep us from falling. That's the good news. We don't have to continue falling. So join us next time for... Lesson number three, Cain and his legacy. And as you know, we're studying Genesis, so that means we're just getting started. See you next time. Thank you.